Hey guys, back with another matchup review. Um, this time I'm going to try and do Snowco. Uh, it's picked up in popularity the last week or two. Um, you know, for a little while it was dipped and you wouldn't really run into it that, that much, but um, in premier events and in league play I've been running into it significantly more the last couple of weeks. Um, and this matchup has a decent amount of complexity and play to it on both sides, so I figured that this would be a good one to do a match run through. Um, if the first one goes fast, uh, I have a couple of other matches that I played versus it recently too, so I might try to do those as well. Uh, let's see how fast we make it through the first few games. Um, so in game one, we're on the draw. This hand is missing a clear green source for the two tutors, but um, as discussed in previous matchups, uh, Ghost Quarter is kind of a green source, especially when we have a land that we can likely afford to get rid of. In this case, we're not really sure the Caracas is going to have any value in the matchup, so in an absolute pinch, um, we could Ghost Quarter that, for, and we have both other combo pieces. We could Ghost Quarter that for the forest um, if need be. We have the stage, we have two tutors, we have a piece of disruption in the Thought Seas, and we're on the draw, so our first turn is likely just going to be Thought Seas off the Urborg. So if we see a green source naturally in the first two to three turns, we're going to be able to combo on turn three. And if not, um, we have a turn four at the latest with a couple of pieces of disruption in Thought Seas and Ghost Quarter. So And Caracas could also be a piece of disruption depending on what they're on. So I think this is a fine keep in the dark. It's not one of our top hands. Uh, since it's not particularly fast, but um, it's certainly keepable. So the opponent plays a prismatic vista pass, which usually means, you know, we're going to see snow basics in the near future. <laughs> One variety of that, uh, yeah, you know, can be a few different decks. But in this case, we're not going to have to wander for very long since we have the, the thought seeds to get a f clear idea of it. So in this case, um, we get a very favorable trade for us. Uh, they force of negation, pitching force of will. Um, so the straight two for one. Um, our draw for the turn is not great. Southern Scrying, we're still missing the green for the turn, but we'll take this trade every day we possibly can. So the opponent's second turn is <laughs> pretty devastating. Um, this came up in the lands matchup as well. Sylvan Library is one of the absolute best cards against us um, in decks that have a variety of answers since we're generally not putting any pressure on their life total. It's usually just a draw four <laughs> as, as they as they see fit and in this case it looks like this isn't Snowco so, or some Snow variant which means they're likely to have life gain as well in the form of Oko or Euro so <laughs> it's not it's not unreasonable to think library is going to draw at least four cards maybe more um in this style of game which kind of puts pressure on us to really threaten to kill them as soon as possible so here we draw the green source it's a little awkward uh, because we just have to straight up burn it to use it but at the same time it's actually pretty good um, because that won't say if we drew a, uh, a fetch land or a forest or a bayou or something like that, to be able to cast our scrying or crop rotation or reclaimer, we would have, well, to cast scrying or reclaimer, we have to delay ourselves a full turn. Um, we could put ourselves in a situation where we try to go with stage Urborg and then crop rotation for depths on turn three, um, but that kind of walks into um, any force. We could could have just played like a green source and crop rotation now, but that's also not exactly the kind of line we would want to take because we really want to save crop rotations whenever possible um, for their answers specifically. So if they set up like a blocker, we want to have crop rotation into step um, and more. The instant speed more will be necessary when they have um, sorts to plowshares where we really want to be able to protect it at instant speed. So in this case, we get a. Uh, the green source we hit is very good because we can scrying without actually delaying the turn three combo. So if the scrying resolves, we literally will just have our work depth stage um, on turn three. So that's pretty good. So in this case, we just play the extra mana on the off chance first on the off chance that they have something weird like days. I wouldn't expect that based on how the, the game's played out yet, but you never know. There's no reason not to play it that way. So we play the scrying for depths. The stage, play the stage and play the scrying for depths and pass the turn. Um, so I 
So the opponent draws one extra off the Sylvan Library and then shuffles. So they're going to get three clean looks again next turn. Uh, and then they ponder and keep. So our draw for the turn is another crop rotation. Um, there's really not much we can do here other than threaten the combo to hopefully tie up their mana, um, which is a common strategy versus these decks. We want to make them... They do have some things that they can play at instant speed, like they can obviously play a Brainstorm or an Ice Fang, that type of stuff at instant speed, but we want to really like tie them up from, you know, they may not have the fourth land, so you know, having the combo up would make them represent an answer instead of, you know, they can't just tap out for Oko, and since they lost some life to the Sylvan, paid some life to the Sylvan Library and fetches, um, they can't just, you know, tap out for a Euro either. Um, so it kind of delays all of their plays by at least a turn, and they don't even have the white source yet, so... Um, yeah, I don't think there was anything that we really wanted to do with our turn other than represent the combo. Um, so again, they draw one extra card. Um, there's the white source. So, didn't mention it earlier. Um, when we are evaluating the hand, basically because yeah, you, know, you can't really guarantee that the matchup is going to work out in this way. Um, but one of the, the cute things about the stage hands in the opener are you always you often get to copy your opponent's lands too. So in this case, the opponent's forest is <laughs> lets us have our own forest, which is nice. So now we do have a green source. Um, it's a little awkward that it's the stage, because um, if we tapped it to, say, play Reclaimer, then we're not threatening the combo. But, you know, having it is still nice. So in this case, we can play the Ghost Quarter. Um, what this allows us to do is, even though we don't technically have the green source if we use the stage, um, we can combo off stage Depths Urborg. Ghost Quarter our own Urborg after the fact if they swords get the basic forest crop rotation for step. So we do technically have a combo plus one protections piece from this spot. So the opponent ponders and shuffles. And plays Oko. Okay, so in this spot, they've seen a few extra cards, but they did shuffle with their ponder. Um, We have Swords to Plowshares covered. Um, what we don't have covered is Swords to Plowshares plus another force. Um, I think the issue with waiting here is, one, they still have a Sylvan Library, so I'm not sure it's getting any better from this spot. We could hope to top deck uh, exactly a second green source, and that would give us double crop rotation protection. Um, but given that they're going to see a fresh three cards with Sylvan Library again, since the Ponder shuffled, um, and the Oko sits there, which can either start clocking us off the food or put additional food into play to give them the ability to draw even more cards with Sylvan Library, I don't think it's getting any better. They could also just find something that's just an annoyance. So they're clearly representing Plow. So if they have the Plow, and we wait a turn to draw a second crop rotation, they could also just draw Ice Fang Quaddle. And if they get an Ice Fang Quaddle into play, and we have to use our step to um, protect from Swords to Plowshares, it puts us in a position where the Oko is going to take care of Velage and make it a 3-3, where they can just force us to crop in a step for Swords, and they block, and then they untap and make it an Elk. And we're probably not winning the game from that spot. So, even though 
it's far from a slam dunk that they won't have another force they've gone through two already they used a force and a force a force will and a force of negation on turn one so there's probably either three or four copies of forces left so I think this is just the spot where we go based on it not getting the situation not getting any better I like to be patient in a lot of situations but this isn't the kind of board state that I think we can be any more patient So we make the 2020, they have the plow that they represented. We ghost quarter ourselves, which is honestly one of my favorite plays in this deck. Uh, we go for the crop rotation, and luckily that's um, good enough in this particular game. Yeah, a lot of times this matchup will come down specifically to, you know, it could go either way. Like they very easily could have had force plus blue card there, and we would have lost because um, they did get to. They looked at three with library, drew two of them, shuffled the third away. Looked at three with library, drew two of them, shuffled the third away. So they did a fair bit of um, and cast a couple of ponders. So they did a fair bit of digging and sculpting. Um, they just didn't happen to. The cards just didn't happen to line up, but they easily could have. Um, so this particular hand has one combo piece, one piece of disruption, and I guess technically the needle's a piece of disruption for, for Oko, that kind of thing. Oh, I guess I should talk about the sideboarding. So normally, against this style of deck, I like to bring in some safekeepers and the two of Rob Decays. Um, we want to keep the combo mostly intact. We don't want to delete, dilute the deck too much. Um, but between Four Swords to Plowshares, the Okos, and various other... Um, random answers that they could possibly have. Um, I think the safekeepers, you, you often get in spots where you use step to protect from plow and you need to attack them over a couple turns. You can't always push through their blockers immediately. Um, so the safekeeper is good in that you can set up where you have three or four lands or you'll, you have three lands and hex mage and you can have a couple of activations where you just have, you just get to four lands in combo where you have a couple of pieces of protection. So the safekeeper is solid in that it can protect itself and the 2020 over multiple turns as long as you don't miss your land drops. Um, and their abrupt decays are just solid catch-alls. Like sometimes they just do something really basic, like uh, move an ice fang out of the way so you can kill them. Um, other times they're killing Oko. You never know what kind of random sideboard options the opponent, or even main deck options the opponent's going to have. Sometimes I see back to basics, that kind of thing. It's nice to have a catch-all, even though it's not a devastating card. It's something that pulls its weight. So those are the cards I bring in. Um, I normally trim Caracas. I mean, you can, s <laughs> I guess you could say it bounces Euro, but that's not something I'm really particularly interested in doing, um, given that the life gain in the card draw is almost significantly more annoying than the card itself being in play. If, the, if they've already cast it and escaped it and it's back in play and attacking, um, we're in bad shape. <laughs> so I think it's just easier to just not bother with that. So that gets trimmed um, and some of the acceleration. So you can trim down a little bit on Lotus Petal and Spirit Guides to make room for the cards. Um, so this hand doesn't have the full combo and outside of the turn one thought sees just it just doesn't do enough um, so I think that's a clear ship this hand has double thought sees one tutor safekeeper the green source is a lotus petal <laughs> so it's it's close. It's probably better than a random five, um, simply because it's got the more important piece to the combo, because scrying can get depths. Um, and it has a really important card in Safekeeper. So... I think it's a fine... <laughs> Fine's not the one, right? It's, it's a... It's a... <laughs> it's begrudgingly a keep, because I think going down to five cards is probably just not where we want to be here, um, especially versus this kind of shell. So I think given that we have Safekeeper and a discard spell, I think this is, this is okay. Uh, so the opponent again starts on Vista Go. So 
So this is the one, this is one of the more, <laughs> I don't know what the correct word is, but um, one of my least favorite <laughs> spots is turn one where you have to basically decide whether or not you feel like factoring Vale into the game. Um, I don't think this is the kind of game where we can sit here um, and try and wait for them to do something. Like theoretically they could take a turn two and play a Sylvan library and then we'd get a clean shot with a Thoughtseize, but Vale's usually only like maybe a two of in this kind of list. So it's the type of thing where we kind of want to sequence our turns or discard on one, Sylvan Scrying on two, and then hopefully find the missing piece, either the Hex Mage or a Crop Rotation or the stage itself, and then play a Safekeeper and try and win that way. So I don't think we want to be... The earliest we would I, we would want to even play a discard spell is probably turn three or turn four, and at that point they've already had their turns three and four, so the most dangerous permanents, Library, Oko, Hero, are all going to be cast at that point anyway. Um, so I think this is just a spot where... You know, they're likely to have something, either Veil or Brainstorm, but I think we still just fire it off anyway. So they do have the Veil, which is kind of a blowout, but yeah, those are the risks we run by uh, playing Discard in this meta. So the opponent plays another basic, leaves Forest up again. Um, no shuffle on the ponder. Draw another basic. Um, which isn't great. Um, so in this spot, you could theoretically think about waiting to tutor. So see if you happen to draw, which, which kind of gives you more outs to draw um, either the stage or the depths, and then you tutor for the missing piece. In this case, I don't like that. Uh, we have the double black if we draw the Hex Mage. Um, we have enough mana to tutor in future turns. And this is just the kind of deck we don't want to give time to. Like if we give them an extra turn. So say we draw a stage or a depths next turn. We have to scrying for the other one, which means we can't even threaten the combo that turn, which means they have their third and their fourth turns um, to tap out, do whatever they want. If we get the depths now, this at least gives us the opportunity to threaten the combo. So if we say, even if we draw a, like a complete blank, like say we draw a Knot of This World or something like that, we can play the depths and pass with Depths, Swamp, Forest, Pedal Up, um, which means they have to respect the combo in one form or another. So because we're representing crop rotation for the combo. So if they don't happen to have a force, they can't tap their mana effectively. If they do tap out, that kind of gives us a lot of information about what's in their hand. Um, so I think it's appropriate here to tutor for the depths. So on the opponent's turn, they play an Oko and make a food. Um, So here we could play the, the Spirit Guide or the Safekeeper. I don't think either of those plays make sense. Again, if we play the Spirit Guide, we're giving them the complete green light that we can't combo. Um, and if we play the Safekeeper, we're giving them the ability to just continuously uh, fire off elk targets at the Safekeeper, and we're not going to be sacking our lands to protect it. So I think the line here is just depths pass and see if we notice anything in their play that kind of gives away whether they have some counter magic. So they play a fetch, make the food a 3-3 three, three, and attack us for 3. So we draw a Thoughtseize. Kind of the same spot as earlier, it's just there's really no benefit in holding it at this point. They brainstorm in response. Uh, so given that they hid cards, <laughs> unless they fetch, of course, uh, this hand's kind of terrifying. Um, in this case, 
I think the quaddle is actually more of a problem. Um, the block into Oko line is a thing. Uh, we have the safekeeper to address the swords to plowshares. Um, Ice Fang, taking Ice Fang away is also their only blue card. So the only way they could have counter magic up next turn is if they have two blue cards hiding on top, like a counter and another blue card, whether it's a third or second counter or another Ice Fang or Oko or something like that, or they could just play uh, draw for the turn, play Astralib and draw the other copy. Uh, but I still think it's correct to take the Ice Fang here. So we just play our land and pass from there. So they play Jace, Brainstorm, make a food, attack us down to 12. Uh, we draw another brick. So this is the point in the game where I just don't think we're coming back from this spot. Um, they could easily just fire off multiple Planeswalker activations at the Safekeeper post-combo and still have plow up. And we brick for the turn anyway, which means we're getting attacked for six from 12 to six next turn. Um, we just don't have enough time to to work through this, so so I scoop it in the face of this. start that over again. I wasn't meant to click through that quite so fast. So we're on the play for game three. Um, so this hand's really interesting. <laughs> it is definitely on the greedier side of keeps. Um, what I like about it is that it has I mean it's gonna be in trouble if the, the Sylvan Scrying gets forced on turn one but if the Sylvan Scrying resolves on turn one um, we have a lot of draws that just allow us to naturally play um, X Mage like with the full combo by turn three so if we burn Catacombs, Petal, and Scrying for Depths on turn two even if we don't draw a land uh, we have the option of crop rotating again if we want for Urborg and playing out Hex Mage. We also have the option of if we want to wait a turn, let's say if we do draw um, the second Black Source, we just play Safekeeper, play the second Black Source and pass, playing on comboing the third turn. Um, depending on what they do, if there's anything in their yard, we could even peek with Surgical Extraction to see what the best line is. But having. Um, Having a line where we could possibly combo without using the crop rotation by turn three is nice. And having, even if we do use the crop rotation, it's possible that we could have the Sylvan Safekeeper in play as well. Or if they just don't have anything going on early, like they kept a slow hand with Oko Euro, um, that kind of stuff, we could just combo on turn two. Um, so it's, it's risky, um, but it's explosive enough that I think it's worth keeping. If it does get forced, we're not just cold either. Um, basically, if it gets forced, we're down the pedal and the scrying, but any land off the top allows us to um, combo in two. If we draw an Urborg off the top, we could crop rot for the depths and, and play the X Mage. If we draw depths off the top, we can crop rot into the Urborg and play. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of. It's, 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 it's not great, it's not a perfect situation, but even if this gets forced, it's not the end of the world. So I think taking the aggressive line here is appropriate. 
Um, so that resolves, which is a really good sign. So, decay is not the greatest draw, but it's not bad either. So, normally, <laughs> normally I laugh when people take lines like this against, <laughs> or I see people take lines like this because I I mostly think they're incorrect, but here, given that the opponent pondered and no shuffled. and had their only land for tapped. Good players are going to put the best card from the ponder um, in the middle or two down, depending on whether they intend to um, shuffle after their next draw, just to play around discard. Like they know I'm an eight discard spell deck and they're tapped out, so there's no threat of veil or anything like that. So the best card of their ponder is likely sitting on top of their deck or two down. So the surgical at worst, <laughs> gets rid of whatever the best card from that ponder is and gives us information as to whether or not we want to go for the aggressive crop rod and turboard, play depths, play hex mage line. Um, so normally I don't like using this in this fashion, but in this case I think it was correct. So. So the opponent's deck looks pretty standard. Um, there's a couple personal choice cards in here. Um, don't always see Leobold, don't always see Jace. Um, <laughs> one card we really need to be aware of is you don't always see Assassin's Trophy. Um, so that's not great news. Um, so their hand is a little slow. Um, so it looks like they're banking on being able to block with Ice Fang into a Planeswalker at the moment. So whatever the next card was, we shuffled that away and were able to take the Ponders out of their deck. And we also know that the coast is clear. Um, to just, you know, straight up go for the combo. So we know an Ice Fang is coming. So the question is, I clicked right through it, but the question at the end of their turn was um, how lucky <laughs> did we feel and what the math says. So any green source off the top would have killed them. Um, so basically any fetch land, any bayou, the forest, um, all of the Lotus Petals, all of the Spirit Guides, um, and even the step itself um, kill them off the top. There are also a number of cards that probably help us. The Needles specifically doesn't actually work in this spot because they have both um, Oko and Teferi, so we can't cut them off with Needle. Um, Not of This World also wouldn't work as protection over two turns because they could just play the Teferi and then we can't play the Knot of This World. Um, so I elected to not go for it. I just think, you know, the 14 green sources plus one step is just not enough outs to justify playing into a known setup of block into Planeswalker. So I elect to just take a draw step. Um, basically, any green source is probably good for us anyway, because we have two protection pieces. So we do draw the green source, so if we had have gone for it, we would have won, but I still don't like the odds there, and I think it was correct to wait. Um, in this spot, one of the nice aspects of having the Hex Mage in play early is with it plus their fetch land, it shuts off Euro as a way to get over 20 life. So chip damage matters a lot in this matchup. You know, the difference between 20 and 21, depending on whether they naturally drew a land versus a fetch land, just comes up a lot. So just being able to 
freely attack with the two on, which we usually can because Ice Fang can't come down. And I mean, they really don't want to be blocking a first striker <laughs> and uh, and giving us a clean shot at them. The Ice Fang's really just for lodge blocking. So the chip damage is very very nice. I'm clicking OK, like this isn't a replay. So here it's a pretty easy play the safekeeper. Um, this will kind of let us know whether they have any counter magic because this can't really resolve or they're going to really struggle to get Lodge off the table. They would need three answers to get it off the table if this resolves. Okay, so they do find a force. So they target the Hex Mage, um, and given that they've already made their land drop for the turn, um, this is an easy uh, combo. And then we have the Abrupt Decay for for the Quaddle, um, for the clean kill. So let's see if I can find another match real quick. Okay, I got one. Try and go through these a little bit faster. This one I'm not as familiar with. The, it's the other match, so we'll have to see. So this hand's not great, but in the dark I think it's fine. Um, we're on the play, so we can just swamp guide scrying for stage, and then we have the combo. We only. Um, I mean, we're a little soft to fast combo, um, maybe a little soft to to wasteland, and if we don't draw another mana source in the first two draws, we'd we'd have to play this or accelerant. We'd have to play this step, which isn't ideal, especially if it's like against a Delver deck or a deck like Stoko that might have flying blockers. Um, but we do have a nod of this world for plow type effects or brazen borrower type effects. Um, so I don't think it's on the higher end of keepable hands, but it's it's okay. Um, so I do end up keeping it and scrying for stage. So now we do have the full combo, even if it is a little bit slow. Um, so the opponent is um, on Snowco. So that's a turn late. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't really particularly help a ton at the moment. Uh, the reason to play depths there specifically instead of stage or anything else is we could just if we draw a hex mage we can just play it next turn um, on top of that if this happens to be the kind of shell that some of these decks sometimes sneak in a wasteland or two so if this if we do run into the kind of player that has something like that and they fire it off that would be good because we have a second copy of depths already waiting So so there they chose to no shuffle. Um, so for our turn we do draw the hex mage. So luckily we didn't play the stage, so this is the threat it should be. So that gets force of willed pitching brainstorm, which is pretty nice. Um, increases the odds that our not of this world will be relevant later. So the opponent plays fetch pass. Um, battle doesn't really particularly matter here as a draw. Um, I guess it does technically threaten um, crop rotation since we have to play the stage as our combo land. So the opponent ends up brainstorm and shuffles. So they've done a decent amount of sculpting this hand with Ponder and Brain, this game with Ponder and Brainstorm already. So they play a second Astrolabe. So this feels like a pretty good spot. Um, 
Uh, if they plow, we have not of this world. If they have plow plus counter, um, we can get both of those out of their hand and still rebuild a little bit already because we already have the second copy of Depths, which is the harder combo piece or the better combo piece. Um, if they have double plow, same thing. We'll get a couple of answers out of their hand. Um, it's possible they're just sitting on Ice Fang Quaddle and a counter, at which point we can just um, play Caesarea Step and go right through. Um, there's really, with the step in our hand, there's very few cards that are going to make waiting better. Um, I guess we could draw exactly a discard spell or one of the two remaining not of this worlds. Um, but those aren't particularly great odds. Um, the crop rotations would just help us reload with a combo anyway. So, and can't get steps. So, I think this is clearly a good spot to go. So the opponent has the plow, we play the Nodus World, and they have a second plow. So the game goes on. Uh, Ghost Quarter is not particularly relevant at the moment, so it's just Depths Pass to at least have the threat of a crop rotation combo. Again, maybe doing some virtual port action where they have to keep up mana out of respect if they don't have a counter spell. Granted, that's becoming harder since they're on uh, land drop five at this point. So the Euro is going to be a problem from this particular spot, um, given that they have plenty of food in the graveyard and we can't combo at the moment. And they're going to be able to go to 23 or 22 if they fetch next turn. And there's really not a lot we can do about that. Sylvan Library, as discussed earlier, is <laughs> kind of a massive problem. Although it's kind of double-edged in this particular spot because I don't think they really want to be... I mean, it's still good to look at the top three and draw. Um, draw the best of the three, but I really don't think they want to be paying life in this spot given that they can go over 20 and make, make our life a lot harder and make cards like Step a lot less relevant. Um, so in this spot... Earlier in the game, when they didn't have three lands, I would um, wait to use this crop rotation during their upkeep, um, or maybe get cheeky and try to do it end step, that kind of thing. Um, in this spot with Sylvan Library, where they're going to see three more cards, I don't think waiting is an option. Um, also, just untapping with five lands, they could literally just hard cast Force of Will or easily hard cast Force of Negation. So, um, as much as I don't like doing this a ton. I think the correct play is to just um, crop rot for the step now. So, <laughs> in a terrible sign for us, um, they keep multiple cards and pay eight life. <laughs> um, and then they play Caracas. Fortunately for us, we do have the Ghost Quarter already. So that's not... Um, not a card that's devastating, so... So they play Euro, gain three life, have another land drop. Um, we go quarter their Caracas and then combo um, because it's just not getting any better. Um, the Euro is just going to bury us. And, um, between the Euro and the Sylvan Library, they're just seeing so many cards. Um, and even if they don't pay more, it, it only takes a couple of swings before they're going to be... Yeah, maybe they drop an Oko next turn, so they could easily be over 20 in two turns. Um, and our top decks are extremely limited in what would interact with what they have going on. So I felt that that was the best spot to go. And they did find uh, another source of plowshares, so we scooped this game. Um, so this is kind of a good example of just the power of the cards they have in their deck. You know, with a source of plowshare deck that can also go over 20, um, that has all the cantrip manipulation and then you know, a card like Sylvan Library and 
you know, block and planeswalker type answers to. There's just going to be games where they have the appropriate amount of interaction. You know, we did see, you know, we had the full combo, we had a nod of this world, we had a crop rotation. Um, drawing the step was awkward, but, you know, this is just, there's going to be games like this where they're just going to have enough interaction to handle what we're trying to do. And that's what happened there. So in game two, um, click through that a little bit too fast. Um, so in game two, we start with, um, well, first of all, the keep I think is fine because we have two lands, a Sylvan Scrying um, plus a Hex Mage. So the Veil of Summer is also nice, which means on two, we know we can likely resolve the Scrying. Even if they try to force it, um, we can pitch Spirit Guide and Veil it back. Um, to get that through, and at that point we have Bayou, Bog, Depths, Hex Mage for the third turn with Nod of this World protection too. And if the Scrying resolves on the following turn when we play the Hex Mage off Bayou, Bog, um, Earth on third turn, we also have Sphere Guide, Veil of Summer. So they would need a double force, double blue card essentially to stop us from getting the combo into play, and then we have a protection piece behind that, plus whatever we draw. So even though not having a discard spell to hand check them, take their best card. It's unfortunate. I think this hand's still uh, strong enough where we can just take turn one off and still be fine. Um, so the opponent starts the game with the traditional snow-covered land into Astrolabe. Um, so we draw stage, which is interesting. So here we have the choice between playing by you or stage. Um, so with stage, we can tutor off guide. No, I don't think that makes any sense. Um, yeah, so it's definitely it's definitely by you and go for the, the full turn faster because we would need to use the spirit guide to tutor if we play the stage. So here we make the play of get the depths with the intention of presenting that combo with a counter spell back up and a protection piece next turn still. So the opponent uh, fetches a forest and passes. We draw a second knot of this world, which is excellent. Um, so here the Hex Mage just resolves. Um, so this is really nice. So now we have the combo plus a counterspell, plus a counterspell, plus a counterspell for their counterspell. <laughs> so this is a pretty good spot. So they flash in an Ice Fang on our end step. So they have a Caracas, which is pretty annoying, actually. <laughs> so in this particular spot, even though we have two Not of This Worlds, I think it's appropriate to wait for a turn. Um, we have, very similar to one of the earlier games. We have the chip damage. Um, I don't think they're going to block Hex Mage with Ice Fang, and even a second Ice Fang. They're certainly not going to. Double block doesn't make any. It doesn't do anything against First Strike, essentially. So we can put them to 17, which takes them off um, any Euro or Oko lines for the next couple of turns. They can get them over 20. Um, we have a lot of draws that can interact favorably with them. Plus, if we go for it, they activate Caracas, we have to use a Knot of This World. Um, we currently can't get through the Quaddle, so we attack it, blocks. They untap, they Caracas, we have to use the second Knot of This World. Um, so from there, we would have Veil of Summer for exactly, um, for exactly Oko, but we wouldn't have any answer to Assorts the Plowshare um, or just a Counterspell. So if they Oko plus... Um, Force of Will or Force of Negation, or even if they just Force of Negation um, one of these, we have to blow the Veil of Summer um, to protect it, and that point they could untap an Oko. So there's just a lot of cards that they could have that would just beat us if we combo here. So, and we have a lot of draws that are live. All discards live, the other Knot of This World's live, all the Safekeepers are live, um, Abrupt Decay is live. Um, so we have a ton of cards that would help our situation here. 
Um, and depending on what we have mana-wise, we may not even have to use the X-Mage to combo. We might just be able to play the stage and combo off the lands and keep X-Mage to kill one of their walkers if they play it, um, especially something like uh, Teferi, which might shut both of these off if they untap, play a white source, play Teferi, and then we're kind of staring at that Caracas, and we can never really interact with it until we find a ghost quarter. Um, so in this case, I think we have to wait for it. So we draw Abrupt Decay, which is great. So that makes going for it um, next turn a lot more reasonable. They would need a second Ice Fang to be able to not die or multiple pieces of interaction and or counter spells to get through our three answers over a long turn cycle. So they take the chip damage, which puts them into the perfect spot. 17 is 17 is ideal for us because, you know, at this point, Euro and Oko don't particularly matter. And once we can take some of their best cards off the table, um, that makes winning the game a lot easier for obvious reasons. So they play the Euro. So best case scenario is they have the Krakus and one land, and we have three answers and the ability to decay the Quaddle. So they play Island, which represents any color for with Astralia. So from this spot, I think it's actually better to use the Hex Mage. Um, you never know when some pilots are going to have some oddball cards, something like a Spell Pierce or something like that. There's no reason to... Um, we're probably either going to win the game here or or we're going to be in trouble. So, Because we're going to be investing all of our resources into, into protecting this, and if it doesn't work, they're still going to have a Caracas at the end of the day. Um, so I think just playing around something weird that they could possibly have is better than, than just tapping out and then spewing the sphere guide to Veil if need be. So they use the Caracas, they use the Plow, and works out nicely and that would the way they um, since they had a plow and not a counter spell they had to tap their last land which means we didn't even have to worry about Veil of Summer protecting their Ice Fang from from the Abrupt Decay so it worked out well and uh, that was game two So for game three on the draw, um, uh, this hand is pretty good. Uh, it doesn't have any way to directly interact with the opponent, um, but it does have the full combo. Um, it does have our resident peak and or if we do draw into discard um, or we have to combo twice and we can remove all their swords or you know mess up some hidden card situations again with brainstorm, that kind of thing, or even just, you know, pay to life, see their hand, <laughs> is, is relevant sometimes when deciding whether to go for it or not. So they ponder no shuffle to start. So here we're in a similar situation to one of the earlier games, uh, but I do not think it's appropriate to surgical here. Oh wait, never mind, I did make the same play again. I take that back. Um, <laughs> I thought I chose not to do that here, but apparently I did choose to do the same thing. Um, and the exact same thing that happened in the earlier game happened. They ended up forcing it. Um, so I'm gonna pretend I didn't say that. So they pawned their shuffle into Astrolabe, so that's obviously why they countered it. They didn't want to lose their hidden card, plus lose a second ponder, so kind of worked out again. I still don't love those lines, but 
given that we didn't have any discard spell, I think it's defensible. So we draw a spirit guide, which means instead of threatening a turn three combo or threatening a turn two combo, um, that's super risky. Um, and against this style of deck, I don't want to ever really do that. If they tap out for something like Oko, I think it can be a consideration, but it's just, it just sets you back so much um, if they do have the counter. So they brainstorm and miss their third land drop. So given that that's the case, um, and they likely have obviously four non-land cards, uh, I don't think we want to give them an out. In this case, they may just straight up be brainstorm locked. They may play another cantrip next turn. Um, we'll just have to see, but I don't think playing into a counter spell um, and putting ourselves down to potentially one land is really where we want to be. So we draw another bayou. So in this spot, it's just land pass. Um, you could make an argument for crop rotting during their upkeep to present the combo. I don't think that really accomplishes much other than giving them free information. Um, you know, it plays around exactly Force of Negation, but they've already used one of their Force of Negations. Um, I think at most they probably have two in their deck total, so I don't think that that's the correct uh, decision. So they missed their land drop again, uh, did not do anything this turn. So they still have a known card that they put back with Brainstorm for next turn. We have the ability to crop rotation twice. So we could beat just a Swords to Plowshares. We could beat just a Counterspell. Uh, we can't beat both. So in this spot, given that we're still virtually porting them outside of, um, they're not going to end step Brainstorm, I don't think. Um, given they're missing land drops. The only thing they can really do if we give them another turn and then pass again is play an Ice Fang. Um, but I think that's an additional part of the reason to wait. They now have obviously five non-land cards, so it's not really that unreasonable to think they might have um, a Swords and a counter, or even two counters. I mean, that would rip their hand to shreds, but we would lose all of our tutors. Um, and two of our lands if that happened, um, using the bayou to search for stage, and then if that doesn't work, um, floating two black off the Urborg in the depths and using the spirit guide to rotate the Urborg for stage. So we would, if both, if they had two counters, we would be down to just depths um, with two lands to K in hand. And if they let the crop rotation resolve and had plow plus counter, we'll be down to, um, just Urborg and a couple of lands in play. So I think given that they're not able to really accomplish anything and they're drawing another known card, I think I like taking one more look and seeing what we can find. So we find a Sylvan Scrying, which I think is great. And given their situation, I think we just want to overload on the ability to protect from whatever they have. So in this spot, if we're scrying for stage, we can play stage and still have the ability to combo up um, with stage, the remaining land we didn't use, um, and, the, and the hidden spirit guide in hand. So even if they do draw a land, which they're not, a land can't be on top of their deck, so they would have to cantrip. So they can't really do anything on their next turn. And if they do tap out for something like Civil Library or something crazy, we can just kill them. And if they don't, then we have a ton of mana up for the following turn. Like we can have Stage, Depths, Urborg, and Double Bayou the following turn if Scrying resolves. So with double, we would essentially have double crop rotation um, protection. So that would play through a Swords and a Counter, um, that kind of thing. And they don't have double white, so they can't have double swords to play around two crop rotations. So I like tutoring for stage um, and seeing what happens. And they're likely to counter this if they do have a counter, since obviously 
this would get the missing piece to the combo. Okay, so they force pitch Oko, which is totally fine. So from here, um, even though that got countered, we're still threatening the combo um, if they tap out for whatever reason or use their Astrolabe to play something. Um, we can crop rotate for stage and use the spirit guide to combo. So they do have the ice fang too, um, but we have the abrupt decay, so that should be fine. So they've still missed their third land draw. Uh, the stage is a really good draw. I think we were in a good spot to begin with here in this situation, but the stage is pretty devastating. Um, now we have the exact situation we talked about last turn where we have double crop rotation. So they finally hit their third land drop. But this is still against four cards with double protection and a removal spell for the Quaddle. I think this is a nice clean spot to go for it. So they plow, we crop rotation, they force of will pitching another Oko. Um, and with just one card in their hand, it would have to basically be um, another Swords to Plowshares um, to prevent this from happening. Um, the only other card from this spot, the only other cards from this spot that would um, keep them alive are uh, Veil for our Decay on their Ice Fang or, or a second Ice Fang. So in this spot, um, yeah, A and the safekeeper is just uh, gonna close the door from here. Yeah, there's nothing they could really do from this spot. Um, uh, this game in particular, I don't think is super indicative of how they normally play out. Um, these decks don't often get stuck on two mana too often, but the first two games were uh, really good examples of situations and hopefully I gave some idea of my thought process on when when I do and don't want to go for it um, versus the cards that they could possibly have. Um, this is a really, really close matchup. Um, I find the games are often, <laughs> yeah, yeah, once you, you just get in all of these spots where they could be swung in a number of directions by any top deck on either side. and. Yeah, you know, that game was the perfect example. Even though they hicked up, hiccuped big time on mana for a few turns, um, if I hadn't top decked exactly the stage on the last, the next to last turn, I would have needed to use the first crop rotation for the stage. They would have swords the second, or they could have countered the first crop rotation. Either way, between swords and counter, they would have been able to, um, if one of the crop rotations was needed to get a combo piece instead of protection, their, their two pieces would have gotten there, essentially, no matter which order they played them in. So, yeah, really close, and um, I guess the best way, as with most matchups, the best way to really get better at it is just get reps in. So if you know anyone that plays this deck, um, try and jam it a few times, and yeah, see how it goes. Uh, I think... I think next video I have a couple of interesting matches um, versus the rug pile um, that Pokemoki built, uh, Jeff White, that uh, I think were pretty good matches. Um, and it's always fun when um, they're both versus the same player, uh, especially when <laughs> it happens to be the deck's creator. Um, so it's really nice. It'll be a, a six game set where we split matches and eat both matches went three games. So I think it was a lot of stuff came up and a lot of interesting decisions. I think I actually made a, a couple of fairly <laughs> uh, significant mistakes during those matches. Uh, it's a new deck. So I think part of it is, you know, 
you have to get reps in versus it. And I've kind of been experimenting with my sideboarding versus the versus that shell too, um, given how new it is. Um, but hopefully I'll have that one together in the next week or so. So, all right. Until then, I uh, hope you guys enjoy this. Hope something in here was useful, and take it easy.